Hello and welcome to My Life on the Line, a podcast by RefCoach. I'm Jack and once again I'm joined by Benji and Ale. On this podcast, we show the humans behind the whistle through the eyes of referees past and present, as well as the broader footballing world. Our guest today is Stuart Carrington. Stuart is a lecturer in the UK and he's the author of Blowing the Whistle, The Psychology of Football Refereeing, a book about match officials that covered all aspects of the psychology of football refereeing. He recently featured in UEFA's mini-series about European referees, Men in the Middle, talking about his findings. Stuart is a curious and passionate football fan. He talked to us about his research, what affects referees' performances, and what are some ways we can improve our performance overall. I recommend a on review. Stop it, stop it, stop it! Stuart, thank you for joining us. Straight from uh, UEFA TV, the man in the middle, uh, talking about referees and their performance and uh, their love of the game, their passion they have, to Ref Coach, what we, we'd love to think it's the podcast that humanizes referees. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So let's dig deep straight into your research. I'm very curious because I know you were not a referee before your research. So what drew you to studying refereeing? It's, yeah, absolutely. I wasn't a referee before I did the research at all. Uh, I became one as, as part of the research. Um, what drew me to it was, I guess, the questions that everybody asks uh, and, and coaches and spectators and players alike. And obviously, I've, I've experienced all of those aspects as well of football. And I've asked the same questions that I think everybody has asked the referees. So these are questions like, oh, how many do they get? How can you not see that? You don't know what you're doing. Um, they bottled that one, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so I'm guilty of all of those. And I'm, I'm quite happy to stand up in front of a room of referees and say it. And I wanted to investigate, I, you know, as a, as a researcher, I wanted to see if there was any kind of scientific evidence to support the claims that are consistently made by spectators and coaches or whether it was com a complete myth. And so that was kind of like my main purpose. And then I guess the other one was when I started to tell people that I was researching referees, the comment that I'd always get back was why? Like why referees? Why are you interested? <laughs> and doesn't that like kind of totally kind of sum up society's view of the officials? They're such an integral part of the game. And yet people just are like, oh, like, who cares? Like you shouldn't even know their names. And it's, you know, uh, Uh, for me, that was equally as revealing. So I just felt it was a really fascinating subject and, and really kind of fertile ground for investigation. Yeah, uh, we, we've spoken in some recent podcasts we, we, we made about how referees are not really included in the football world. Mm -hmm. It's more, mm -hmm. you know, there's coaches, there's teams, there's the managers, there's the owners, there's the fans, and they're all part of football. And then, and there then there's those other guys. Yeah, yeah. There's, <laughs> there's these other guys that are needed. You need them for yeah. the game to go ahead. But you don't necessarily want them. And acceptance of the referees and the referees' decision, it's always, historically, it's really hard by yeah. everyone. It's what, it's what Tom Webb said when he came on. He's, yes. I've seen on social media, you've been interacting with Tom, but he, he said the exact point which you just talked on. You know, it's, it's, it's football and then there's the referees that we're not one or not yet one. Absolutely. I mean, Tom's a fantastic researcher and, uh, I, you know, I referenced Tom's work in the book uh, rather frequently and he also had many informal conversations with me to assist me writing the book so I have to give Tom a lot of credit for his for his assistance there I think there's there's two ways of looking at it. something that Tom would look at is the historical and social influence so if in Tom's uh, most recent book about the mental health and, and abuse of referees mm -hmm. he'll touch upon to quite an extent like the historical and sociological impacts of that so it's you know it was traditionally that there's always been a class divide as most sports with their roots in, in the UK have. So, you know, the officials would, particularly when the game became professionalized, the officials would be more middle or upper class because you had to understand the, the laws of the game and the participants uh, when it became professionalized would be working class. So there was kind of like a, you're just trying to control me, tell me what to do, that kind of a thing. Um, so that's kind of like the historical and sort of like social aspects of it. Um, there was also, you know, gamblers would place bets. And then if the referee would give a penalty that would stop you winning money, Uh, you know, who's going to take the brunt of that kind of blame, if you like, for you losing your weekly wage, the, the referee, of course. So there's that aspect. And 
that that's a really valid aspect. You can't disassociate psychology from kind of sociology and historical factors. What I'm interested in or kind of lean more towards is the psychological reason why. And, and, and Tom does as well in his most recent book. And, and I think what we sort of label referees as is, is an out group. So mm-hmm. when you're a supporter, you know, you, you, if you support you know, Manchester United or Liverpool or Spurs or whoever it is, it's like you, the players, the coach, everyone, you belong in that out group. And then there's kind of everyone else is, 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 is part of, of something else like you just mentioned there. So there's, there's, the, there's the players, there's the coaches, there's the fans, and then there's the other guys. And those other guys are to be blamed for everything. <laughs> Bases, uh, in the book, I like to sort of talk about kind of like, you know, popular culture, popular literature. And there's a great book in Tim, uh, great book. There's a great passage in Tim Park's book, A Season with Verona, where he talks about in Italy, there's your team and everyone else is i bastardi. And, and there's just people that no one knows about. And the only person that has a face that has kind of, that represents the bastards is, is are the referees. Um, and that just totally sums up this, this sort of distrust that we have of officials. There's worldwide, by the way. It's not isolated to the UK or Australia or Europe or anything. It's worldwide. And so, you know, you said uh, you used to be the person and, and we all were who used to stand up and shout at the referees and have a go. Are you still that person? I'm still that person, even though I'm a referee. But you still, <laughs> has it changed for you? It's, oh, it's completely changed. But for me, it's the nature of the criticism has changed. And speaking so extensively to referees, one thing I've noticed is th- th- they're not kind of oversensitive to criticism. Right? Referees will understand why right? they have a bad game. I've spoken to many high level refs that's, that will tell you, and it, and it features in the documentary as well, where they'll say, you know, I know straight yeah. afterwards if I've had a bad game like a player knows like a coach knows um, so they're not different in that respect and for me like referees don't even mind criticism if someone says you know you made a mistake here like they're, they're accepting of that because the only way to improve and to get particularly if you want to be a high level referee is, is to accept errors for me what I've, what I've changed is the nature of my criticism um, I've realised how uh, foolish some of the criticism might be because you realise all the different intricacies and all the different factors that will influence a referee's decision making that often they have absolutely no control over at all. Um, so I think that that's what has changed. And I think if everyone kind of took that approach and said, well, yeah, there's a big difference between maybe the personal level of insults that a referee gets and a more kind of constructive level. Let's look at the systems behind why errors were made rather than just blaming the individual, mm. I think is more helpful. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I think, you know, we're by far our own harshest critics. Mm. You know, I'll I'll pull apart. Well, actually, I think Ale is my harshest critic, so I'm probably <laughs> my my second harshest critic. But no, you you over analyze, you watch back, and you pull apart these what people might perceive to be minute things, but you pull them apart for how can I do better? Because at the end of the day, you just want to improve, and then. I'm sure you learned that along the way. Absolutely, yeah. Referees have different challenges to play as well. So players are the same as well, yeah. But a player will be their harshest critic or they know when they've had a bad game. Coaches know when they've made a mistake. And I know that from being a player and being a coach, the difficulty is, or maybe sort of the change is, if you're a player, you get like immediate feedback. So when you, you know, if you take a shot and you miss, you know immediately that you are unsuccessful. With an official, you have no idea because you get a to make a decision and I know there are times where you know we've made decisions then immediately afterwards thought actually I'm not so sure now however most of the time you're, you're still like totally unaware and only the elite guys get to watch the replays but even then it's a, you know, a considerable amount of time afterwards so that's particularly challenging for an official and uh, until you get uh, coming in in your earpieces uh, <laughs> VAR to ref and you, your I heart recommend drops, and you, go, review. you go oh dear what's happened what's yeah. gone wrong here <laughs> Yeah, that brings about its own kind of like pitfalls as well, because, you know, how does that make someone feel if someone's like immediately telling you you've made a mistake? Mm. There's there's some, lots of benefits to that, but there's also some sort of psychological drawbacks yeah. as well. I've seen it, you know, on games that I've been involved in where I remember really clearly there was an offside and uh, the assistant um, kept his flag down, ball went in the back of the net, but then put his flag up for an offside in the build-up. And mm. um, he did the right thing with keeping his flag down, but he got the decision wrong. It wasn't offside. So the, the correct outcome was reached, but for the rest of the game, he was silent. We, it happened in about the 30th minute, and the rest of the game, we just heard nothing from him. Nothing from him. It's- yeah, I, 
it, it, this is this is my point. This is one of the things that interested me in the book. You know, there's, there's all these kind of psychological explanations for things like that. So you know, we turn this one as like avoidance. So like humans tend to want to uh, kind of avoid the worst case scenario. So the worst case scenario for a referee is to be labelled like incompetent or even worse, a cheat. Which is uh, uh, one referee told me is the real C word for a referee is to be called a cheat. And and so you know, if you make it like a high profile mistake, you know, for the next 10, 15 minutes, the you know, the, the human solution is to keep your head down um, and not, you know, but unfortunately when you're an official, you're there to make decisions and those decisions are probably going to be unpopular with like 50% of the population at the game. And like, how do you, how do you deal with that and, and combat that kind of human nature side of not wanting to draw too much attention to yourself after a big mistake, but, and yet still wanting to fulfill your role. It's a really challenging role. And I guess that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write a book to explore all this kind of psychological influence. Yeah, and so you got in as an outsider in the refereeing world. Mm -hmm. You started researching mesh officials. And how did you view on referees change? Uh, predominantly, I just gathered like a lot of more sympathy for, for officials because I realized how hard it was. The book started, I just wanted to research the effect of a crowd. I was convinced that if you've got 60,000 people trying to influence your decision, or even if you just got really high profile players or managers like trying to influence your decision, sooner or later, you're going to buckle under that pressure. It's a bit like a cricket umpire. Yeah. You know, if, if everyone's like kind of appealing, you know, the first or second time that you might not get it, but with a third or fourth time, that pressure starts to mount and like, you know, it, it must be impossible to resist. And I just kind of wanted to research that. And then as I researched it more and more, I started to realize I could start to associate all these different theories that, that, you know, I'm kind of well versed in in psychology to justify or explain some decisions and realize that it's not like the referee is an individual. This is why I hate personal abuse that officials get. Like, I'd rather look at the system and how things can change to help them. And so, I guess, you know, to answer your question, the reason, main thing that's changed for me is just a greater understanding of the role. A question I had on there, because obviously, you know, when you have 60,000 people yelling at you, it's weird. And you said in the book quite often, Every referee you asked to basically said, no, nah, I just shut them out. They don't really, I don't really mm -hmm. think of them. But obviously it's there in the back of your head. You know that's happening. And when the crowd goes, oh, you know, you expect, oh, there's something bigger. If the crowd doesn't say anything, then, well, maybe it's not as big. So that obviously, yeah. it's one of those external factors that uh, works a part in it. But a question I had while reading the book is like, well, do you think maybe, because, you know, you, meant, you talked also about, how there are more fouls or more disciplinary sanction for the away team, for example. Mm -hmm. Do you think maybe the crowd could also have an effect on the away team themselves? So if the away team have 60,000 people screaming against them every time they touch the ball, they're getting bowed. Do you think that may be building some frustration and that could be also a result of more fouls and more sanctions for that team? Absolutely, yeah. It's one of the difficult things to do when we're analysing sports, particularly a dynamic sport such as football. So what I mean by that is, there, are, first of all, there are lots and lots of variables at play. So, for example, you just mentioned there, there's like a home team, there's an away team, there's the officials, there's the crowd, like time changes, situation changes, and it's a particularly fast moving game as well. So there's lots and lots of things to consider. I think it'd be really foolish to isolate one thing. So we can't possibly say that the referee is responsible for more sanctions towards like the away team. What we can say is they are a significant factor in that process. So absolutely right. So what once, for example, like one theory that may apply here is Bandura's theory of self-efficacy. So how confident you feel in a specific situation. Bandura states, it's one of the most cited like theories in psychology. And one thing that this particular research stated was that verbal persuasion influences how confident we feel. So essentially, if I'm sitting there and I'm saying to Jack, oh, I keep going, Jack, you're doing really well then he's going to start to feel good. He's going to start to feel confident about what he's doing. Now, if I'm sitting there, I'm saying, Jack, you are awful. Like you keep making mistakes. Like you're absolutely rubbish. If I'm doing that for 90 minutes, he's probably going to start to doubt himself and feel a little bit less confident, right? Imagine being an away team player at Anfield, Old Trafford, the Emirates, Stanford Bridge, whatever. Okay, and you've got like a large number of people not only encouraging your opponents, but trying to discourage you and often using rather choice language as well. <laughs> like that's going to affect you, okay? So when we talk about like away performance and maybe sanctions against the away team, 
Of course, it's not just about that. There's also like physiological things. So when players play at home, they report higher levels of testosterone production because it's kind of, this is my house. I'm going to protect it to quote Kevin from Home Alone there. <laughs> so it, good, good timing with it being the festive season. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a little bit like that. So there's like a physiological reason. There's a psychological reason. So about this sort of like confidence and persuasion. There's also like a familiarity reason. A great quote that I really enjoy applying here is Main Defoe, you, you scored a vast majority of his goals for Spurs at home. And when he was asked why he performed so well at home, he said, well, it's because the pillars on the East stand, I've played there so often that I know where the goal is, even when my back's to the goal, because I can judge from like the advertising boards and the pillars. So I'm kind of more familiar with that. So, you know, there's, you know, Michael Jordan talks about going to grounds, uh, basketball courts when he was playing and just becoming as familiar as he could, like with the surroundings to improve his confidence. So there's all these different things that affect that. However, that particular piece of research did a regression analysis to eliminate all those variables or as best as possible. And they still found that referees sanction away team players a little bit more. So I wanted to know why, like why that was. And that's something that I explore in the book. Do you think that it's changed or maybe changing now that there's no crowds? Yeah, 100%. So we've seen that away teams are winning more. Um, when there's no crowds. So we just know that's a statistical kind of significant uh, finding. Um, so the Bundesliga did a, a quite significant piece of research here and found that since you know, when COVID uh, stopped crowds attending, away team victories went up, home team victories went down. So we know that's a considerable factor. What I'm particularly interested in is that kind of experience of the officials. One piece of research that I'm working on at the moment, which I hope to be published rather soon. So you're getting a little bit of a, hot, a, hot, a hot, snippet hot here. A ref coach, a ref coach exclusive. <laughs> I can't give away too much, but what I can say is it, it's very conflicted with elite officials, whether they prefer it or not. So I've had some, they, I, like, I don't mm. like it. I, I, they feel that um, it's the disruption to what they used to is so great that their performance is suffering. So they think that the players don't perform as well without a crowd and they don't perform quite as well about a crowd. A nice theory to relate this to would be called social facilitation. And social facilitation suggests that when you're really good at something, like a referee is good at officiating, like a player is good at playing, when you do it in front of an audience, you play better. Okay. Whereas if it's something that you're not very good at or you're a complete novice on, an audience will make you play worse. Someone like myself that is really bad at tennis, if you go and put me in the you know Australian Open final in front of 20,000 people, or whatever, I'm going to play really bad. Whereas if you just put me down a local park and just have me playing with a friend with no one there, I'd probably play a little bit better. Okay. And obviously it flips around if you're Roger Federer or Novak Djokovic or whoever. So that's kind of one explanation. But then I've had other officials say, I actually find it easier. So I've had some officials say, I, I actually prefer it because I can focus on what I'm trying to do more. And I don't have to worry about the social effects of a crowd. Or the social effects of the crowd is something that's been extensively researched. It's interesting, right? Because so I don't know which one of those I fit into, but I always feel I referee better on games with a bigger crowd and a bit more going on them. And the mm. and I don't know if that's internal motivation. You know, I'd always prefer, oh, not just prefer refereeing a top of the table game, but I feel like I referee better in those games than say, you know, where if you have a middle of the table game where there's not much on the line, I feel like I, I lose concentration more. Maybe uh, my standard of refereeing isn't as good. And I know it's easy to say, oh, you should only referee to your standard. You shouldn't let the game dictate that. But in reality, I, f I find that really, really challenging. Yeah. And I guess, you know, the, the crowd, I'd be the same. I, when I used to ref with a big crowd, I would just bring out the best I could. Yeah. Me, I think it's probably the positive stress where, you know, you do feel the pressure of, oh, I got to perform. So it's time to actually bring out, you mm. know, the polished whistle and just give the 200% because all these people... I would just want to leave them in awe and be like, oh, you know, maybe not talk about the ref, but at the same time sort of go, well, you know, I've had such a good performance mm. in front of so many people. It's that almost self-validation where I say, well, I can do it in front of these people and not feeling the pressure. So maybe that positive stress versus, I guess, someone that likes less crowds is probably because maybe a bit more, you know. You, you always say uh, I used to be a flamboyant referee, <laughs> typical Italian, going bibbidi bobbidi and throwing my hands around. So for me, being a bit of a showman, that helped. And you are kind of like that, you know, you can be a bit of a showman. So if you, that's not your personality, 
you surely would be on the other side where you don't like the crowd. Mm. The other thing I'd say is when you've got the crowd, say you make a mistake quite early on in the game, they're going to let you know about it. The crowd mm. is on to you. If you make a mistake, you it's a bit of a wake-up call that you've got to, okay, let me get my head back into this. But if there's no crowd, um, say, for example, the experience pre-COVID was like a pre-season game, sometimes played behind closed doors, you can get away with a lot because if, if um, the players haven't seen it, no yeah. worries, you get on yeah. with it. And you haven't got that kick up your ass, your wake-up call to get it right. I, you, you guys have just like hit like all the nails on the head there. I mean, the first thing I'd say is, is like Jack, you mentioned there about how you prefer with the crowd. Like, how long have you been refing for? Uh, Twelve years, thirteen years. So yeah, that's significant. You know, that's a real long time. You've gathered lots of experience. So, you know, like I mentioned there, social facilitation would suggest you're good at it. You've you've acquired many years of experience, many minutes of experience, and therefore it's more likely you're actually going to prefer to that to a crowd and. One interesting thing and something that I cover in the book is the impact of like anxiety and stress. And because the one thing that always wants to come up, people always say, oh, you know, like if you're really stressed, you know, what impact does it have on performance? And, you know, the, the difficulty in answering that question is it's, it's completely individual and it can be good and it can be bad. So anxiety can often help. The reason we have anxiety, the reason we have stress as a human kind of function is because it can direct our attention to things that need to be done there and then. You know, so if you're particularly worried about something, the reason you're experiencing that, that's like your brain's way of saying, like, pull your finger out and like, deal with this because it's, it's pressing. You need to do it now. Whereas if you're not particularly experienced, you don't know what to do. So you're experiencing stress, but you don't want to do about it. And therefore you can often focus on totally, totally uh, irrelevant stimulus. I, some of the examples you make in the book about this are actually quite good. Because now that I've been coaching for a few years, uh, I can see, you know, you mentioned, I think you talk about a referee that just started and they were talking about uh, a mass confrontation. And you go, I had no idea what to do, but then afterwards... Oh, it, now it's easy. Whilst, you know, thinking about 22 people screaming and yelling at each other and handbagging or trying to punch each other. It's like, how do you manage that? And referees are just used to it because oh, I've seen so many. I've done it. I have that experience. Um, so it's, I, it's, so, it's very, very interesting. Like, I mean, we mentioned there about like, individual differences and there's so many things that will have an impact with all these different variables and whatnot. But occasionally you kind of get this really consistent theme. And one of the consistent themes that comes out of every piece of research is, is the role of experience. So like you just said, the, the mass confrontation, the first time that happens, you know, you're probably going to be looking at things that are completely irrelevant. Um, to, to use a nice example I use in the book, something that always comes up is our players should ref. And it, what it does is it just assumes that to be a good ref, you just need to understand the game. No, you need to be a good referee. It's a role-specific skill. And so when, you're, when you get a player refereeing and, and a, a, a colleague of mine that I spoke to at another university did some great research on this. They looked at gaze, so where people look when they're making decisions. They looked at rugby, coach, uh, rugby referees, excuse me. And during the scrum, they found that official, like trained officials, they look at the hips and the shoulders of the rugby players. OK, that's all they're looking at. OK, and that's how they manage and, and kind of, you know, adjudicate over a scrum. When they gave players or spectators or novice referees you know, the same technology, they found that some of them are reading the advertising boards <laughs> like, while the scrum was going on. Because they're just like totally looking at it. It's such an intense thing going on in front of you. You know, you've got like you know, 20 guys, or whatever, like, you know, like in a scrub like they're just they don't know where to look so in a mass confrontation the first time i probably had to de deal with one as a referee i was probably looking everywhere thinking oh what the crowd thinking and oh what's that what's going on over there where's the ball you know whereas now it's yeah step back focus on like the one or two kind of main instigators yeah and that's it yeah and this it's the same thing i always love when you go and mentor a referee on their first game or a second game and there'll be a goal kick right and and the uh, referee was his head will follow the ball and he'll just look at the ball. He's not looking at <laughs> yeah. not looking at the two players that are actually making the challenge. <laughs> so it's, 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 that's a, that's a perfect example. I've stolen it for the next book. <laughs> <laughs> Credit to referee. You want some royalties? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the a very interesting thing is that so you've done your research, you've done the book, and then you decided there was a good idea to try it for yourself. How did that go? Yeah, when well, I signed up, but the first thing they asked when I went to my ref, you know, the ref course is they said, why are you doing this? Like, why do you want to do it? 
And uh, I was surrounded by like mainly like 16, 17 year old lads that just wanted a little bit of extra money at a weekend or whatnot. And, and I was like, yeah, I'm doing research for a book, uh, which I guess, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I found rather interesting, but yeah, I, I actually, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, and then as soon as I started to put things in practice, I was like, wow, like some of this research is really pertinent. Some of this research really has an impact on, on referees. It was just, it's always addictive as well. Like I love the challenge of it. That's, that's what appeals to me. Yeah. So it's the intrinsic motivation. Yeah. yeah. Intrinsic motivation. Why do we do it? And that's something that you touched on in your book. Um, we've spoken mm. about a little bit on the past episodes of the podcast, but now you've done the research, you've got the, the evidence to say this is why uh, referees want to do what they do. So um, what, what is it? Why do referees want to referee? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is love it again. So I can't stress this enough because uh, one of the sort of criticisms that referees often get kind of like thrown at them is, oh, you don't really care. You just rock up, you take the money and then, and then you go home and you don't really care what happened. And actually, that's just, it's just not true. Um, so I, I kind of are very confident in saying to people that that's just absolute rubbish. It, it, referees often do this alone. So particularly at lower levels, mm. they travel alone, they do it alone, they go home alone. And, and it's, it's so difficult to do that if you don't really enjoy what you're doing. Additionally, we have lots and lots of evidence to suggest that people that are intrinsically motivated actually do a better job. So for example, people with high intrinsic mo motivation they strategize more. So actually think about it in their own time. So like Jack, you mentioned earlier on, like you have a bad game, you go home and you're like, oh, like this is what I did wrong and this is what I could have done better. That's that's because you care. Whereas if you were doing a job that you didn't have any interest in, you're not going to invest more time and energy in it than you need to. So that's one, like we know that it directs attention. So I, you actually pay attention to it when you're when you're doing it. Obviously, you know, the, the case of watching the goal kick and you're just staring at the ball, okay, your attention's not directed in the right place, but still directing attention to the task. Um, we, we actually try, like we put loads of effort in and you cannot simply make a career or sort of like progress up that refereeing ladder without having high levels of intrinsic motivation. That's not to say there's not other motivations that go along with it. It's just that the one thing that always comes out when you speak to referees is they really enjoy the game. And for me, just being at like a time in my life where I'm too old and too injured to play anymore, I'm, I'm, I don't have the time to dedicate to coaching because I know how much time and, and energy that takes up and, and not a credit needs to be given to the coaches for doing that. Refereeing was like a perfect other avenue for me to explore that it got me involved in the game, kept my fitness up, the movements that you enjoy doing. Um, and, and so, yeah, just, just that love of that game and the challenge as well that it presents in front of you. The, the same challenges that the players face, by the way, just trying to overcome obstacles in order to succeed face the referees as well. Hey listeners, we interrupt this podcast to tell you about something new and exciting coming to the Ref Coach podcast channel. As you know, our aim is to provide referees with world-class coaching no matter their level or location. To help us do this, we're launching a new podcast that provides short educational conversations on a wide range of refereeing topics. We'd love you to give it a listen, so keep an eye out for it in your podcast feed. I wanted the final part of the book to be like, okay, so what can we actually do about it? Like, how can referees like improve performance? But also, like I mentioned earlier on, you can't really disassociate psychological performance to kind of like the social element that, that happens elsewhere. And so one thing I really wanted to do was kind of maybe suggest, well, there are lots of things that we can do to help referees. So one in the book, I present six areas that we could do to, to help officials improve and perform better. So like one of them is to improve the numbers of referees. Mm. So one, one reason for that is it combats lots of, lots of like previous effects that I talk about in the book. So one would be like assimilation effect. So what happens before might influence what happens in the future. And so if you have an official that is consistently being perceived, and I say perceived because it may not be true, but being perceived as favoring one team over the other, that that might have an effect on future decisions. Like another thing that might happen is like reputation of teams. So we know that, uh, and I present a study in this in the book, if, if you inform a group of referees that team A are particularly violent and aggressive and team B aren't, then they're going to penalize team A to a more severe extent because they feel they need to control them more. And, and that's when you start to introduce like kind of more subjective judgments, which are natural, but sometimes unhelpful. 
So I think like one area is, is to improve the number of referees. But in order to do that, you can't just say, well, let's, you know, let's just try to go on a big recruitment drive. You've got to improve that relationship between referees and the other groups that we've mentioned earlier on on this conversation. So I think there's a few areas we can do that. So another area of, of the six is like the media and the media's role. So I think the media needs to frame how they present referees much better. So there's a couple of examples I bring up in the book. First of all, tends to be if a referee makes a good decision, it's, oh, they got it just about right there. They kind of attribute it almost to chance that the referee's got that right. Or it's kind of really glossed over, like probably a right decision and then moved on. And that's not necessarily a problem, but it becomes a problem when, when they get it wrong it's kind of like they're lambasted for it. And, and I have to admit, this happens to the players as well. So referees aren't kind of like isolated in this. You know, if a player makes a mistake, it's, oh, they have to be dealing with that better or they have to be doing this. It's like, well, they're human beings. They make a mistake. Um, one thing that always like really makes me laugh is when people in the media will cite something and I give examples of this in the book and they'll s- explain why the official is wrong. And actually, the official is dead right. It's just the pe- person <laughs> in the media <laughs> don't know the laws like, and that's the problem and I, and I find this absolutely astonishing really frustrating one example I give, give in the book is uh, an ex-British footballer stated um, in one game like that's absolutely not a yellow card and then underneath I present the law that states absolutely actually absolutely is a yellow card <laughs> And he just didn't know because he doesn't know the laws. So, and that's okay. Like maybe it's not necessarily his job. He's not a free assessor, but then you shouldn't put yourself in a place where you're, you're pretending to be. So I think that's one issue that we can do to help referees. I think another really important aspect is to develop psychological training. So it's probably the area that's not only the most uh, neglected, it's also an area that referees report they want more on. So there tends to be a lot of focus on like physicality, like fitness yeah. of referees, um, a lot of focus on video training. And I'm not saying those things aren't important because they are, but psychological skills training is one of the most valued and sought after tools for officials. And I'm not sure what the situation is like in Australia, but in the UK, unless you're in the elite group, which is a very small percentage, you receive no psychological support or training whatsoever. And that has massive implications, not only on well-being, as, as Alessandro mentioned previously, but also on performance. Is that psychological in terms of getting better at making decisions or is it like resilience? and which, which, both. both? So I was going to say, actually, it's one thing that people do is they tend to think those things are mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm. So one thing that we know is that the, the, the way that a human like, operates is, is a sign of how they are functioning at that particular time. So what I mean by that is someone is feeling like particularly anxious, that can really sway decision-making like one way or the other. And people that are functioning well as a human being, they're experiencing high levels of well-being. They're actually striving. They actually seek challenges. They actually see things as, as an opportunity to improve and perform rather than a threat. And so I think by improving well-being, psychological well-being, you actually improve performance. So I don't think those two things are completely different. Yeah. I think that's really important because, you know, if you can go and referee knowing that you're confident in your means and you know you're going to make mistakes and you can accept them and you can work on them to improve you have that growth mindset versus that stress and tension and fear of being judged making a mistake and most of it it's all in your mind you know because yes of course there's always going to be situations where players are going to let you know and those things are going to happen but really as you said you know and as you said jack as well before it really it's a challenge with yourself you go and unpack your decision and sometimes it's hard to deal with your mistakes and we've all been through it through a a day where we know we really screwed up and you go oh am i good enough for this what am i gonna do so having and that's not that common to be able to get over those things it's sometimes some some people are more likely to do so because experience outside football led them to be to have that sort of strength some people don't yeah. and it's it's the same situation i think all over the world with this that is in england there's on the elite the elite get access to sports psychologists uh, that go with them and take them through the whole process through the whole journey but then the moment you go down the bottom in the grassroots or even just second or third divisions you don't have any and it's quite interesting the concept of you don't have that training and then you're supposed to go to the elite level and be exposed to hundreds of thousands of people or in the case of the premier league the whole world 
you know, La Liga with Barcelona, Real Madrid, and the top teams in Italy, they follow from everyone, you know, from all over the world. Everyone, like, you have millions of people watching you. Or think of Champions mm-hmm. League officials, but they never had their training. Or maybe they just started having it when they get to that level. You see, the, I mean, like an argument is, and I've, and I've seen this argument posited, and I'm not saying it's a completely irrelevant one, is that you need to go through that to kind of toughen yeah. up, essentially. So by going through all these lower levels totally alone, you kind of sort the wheat from the chaff. There's, there's kind of one argument for that. But for me, what you end up doing is you end up losing officials because some people would have probably stayed the course if they just had that little bit more support. And there's a big difference between, well, you know, you kind of need to go through this alone a little bit and we're going to offer you no support or guidance at all. Like in no other industry would you say, okay, for the first six, seven years, we're not going to talk to you. We're not going to tell you what to do. We're going to give you absolutely minimal training and hopefully you come out the other side. And if you can't, you just weren't tough enough. Like for me, that's, it's just bonkers. Yeah. It's just insane, particularly at a time where we know that the retention of officials is at an all time low. And it's getting to the point where loads of governing bodies, not just in football and not just in the UK, but elsewhere, particularly in the United States, they're, they're saying we're not going to have any officials in like 10, 20 years time because they're just receiving so much abuse. Mm, yeah. And that goes back to what you were talking about before about increasing the numbers of referees, because the more yeah. referees you have, the more support you're going to be able to give because if you have people that again going back to the motivations if you have people that came in for the love of the game they're going to stay on later on to then give that support to others which to some extent it's what absolutely we want to do yeah it's something that we liked we want to do with ref coach i mean i always say we have tons of people reaching out via messages and saying oh i think i got a decision wrong over the weekend and everyone was screaming at me how do i get over it and, you know, it's, there's clearly a, a, a hunger for that. that. That social support is so key. And one of the things that's really surprised me, because I was completely ignorant to it before I wrote a book and started talking about it, is you know, I would never have known that these referee associations or podcasts like yourself like exist mm. unless I was fully aware. And it's kind of like this really niche little group, you know, it's like, like bodybuilders or surfers or something like that, that they have their own kind of little social groups yeah. that they operate in offer support and, and advice and kind of the ability to communicate. And I just think that by sharing the sort of things that are discussed here and elsewhere with, a, with, you know, with the wider population can only be a good thing for referee support and understanding. Yeah, I definitely think so. But on, uh, you know, I guess we've just touched on maybe the more negatives or the darker side. We, we did a podcast with Derek Ray, uh, the, the okay. commentator, and, and we were so impressed by the work he puts into his preparation and his understanding of the laws of the game. And we actually did a, a pop quiz of, yeah. of the laws of the game with him. <laughs> and I've, we were very impressed with his knowledge. So there's definitely some commentators out there uh, fighting the good fight and uh, practicing what you were, what you were saying. I completely agree. Yeah, can't paint, paint everyone with the same brush at all. Um, and I actually find the commentators normally very well clued up. Um, and I just, but I just think it's, it, it's you know, there's areas of the media that certainly need improvement. Of course. Improvement. Of and course. Derek mentioned that it's as well. Sometimes people refereeing the game, they comment on referees based on what they think the laws should yeah. be mm-hmm. and not what they actually mm-hmm. are. And um, as you're saying, these areas are all intertwined, that part of, um, the role of the media, the role of having more referees, and these are all areas that we all need. They all are intertwined to moving things, moving things forward. I mean, th- one of the areas that you mentioned earlier about these six areas is, is like law changes. You mentioned there they'll comment on this is how I think the law should be. Well, you know, we we, we sort of chop tr- tr- and change the laws all the time. Like football, association football has more law changes than any other sport I can think of. Like every year, it's quite hard to keep up to date. And that's because we're constantly questioning and trying to make things better. But if you know, reading the wording of these laws, that, that it deliberately leaves things open for interpretation and subjectivity. And, and maybe that's the appeal of it. That something that's come up from VAR and like the offside lines yeah. to me is now like fans are saying, you've got to apply a little bit of common sense. Well, previously, everyone was screaming for objectivity, you know, so actually, what do you want? There's a a famous sports philosopher that I like to talk about with my students called Bernard Suits. And Suits uh, kind of highlighted four areas that he thinks you need to have in order for something to be a sport. And one of them is an element of chance. 
So he's saying if like, if everything goes to plan, it's not really a sport. You kind of need to have that element of chance where, you know, the ball can take a lucky bounce or whatever. And one of those elements of chances is, you know, the referee might not see something. And actually from a fan's perspective, because we're football fans as well, right? Like, does that not make it more exciting that like occasionally, you know, your team might get a goal that should have been an offside and it wasn't. And you can kind of have that smug, you know, kind of celebration <laughs> or likewise, you can concede a goal that's, that's maybe should have been offside or a foul or whatever. And you can kind of feel bitter about that. And for me, you know, is that part of the appeal of football and sports generally, or do we want this very clinical game? And I don't know if I have the answer to that, but I don't think anyone else does. And I think we need to make up our mind. Yeah. We, in the moment we want to have our cake and eat it. Whereas exactly. that's not possible. <laughs> you yeah. can't either right. offside is correct and it's black and white, which it is, or yeah. it's, comes down to human error and there will be mistakes you know which is the lesser of two evils i don't know yeah exactly exactly and people need to figure out that and or, or embrace that uncertainty mm. and say look yeah, it's going to happen sometimes we don't really know what the best decision is yeah and i think another factor to that and i believe you touched that on the six areas uh, you mentioned transparency and that's something mm. i think it's very important and there's not enough of it you know mm. uh, the mls does it really well pro yeah. They do weekly videos on YouTube explaining the VAR decisions. And that's, mm. they're the only ones in the world that do that. But mm. I think if there was an official source, for example, in England would be the PGMOL, in Italy would be the mm. Italian Referees Association. You know, after the weekend, they have uh, someone that goes out to the bank media and explains the decisions and says, this is right, this is wrong, and this is why. I think they mm. would just put to silence, you know, a lot of the controversy because people go, well, this is what the actual reason behind the decision is. Well, that's it. There's no more the, the classic pub talks. I call them pub talks because there's people going, oh, but this is it. This is that. And there's all these myth, myths that go on. Like people talk about uh, procuring damage to a player. And I'm like, that's never been written in the laws of the game in a hundred years of existence. So if there was mm -hmm. someone that officially goes, this is the answer, this is what the law said, this is the official interpretation, that's it. And that's where the, the, the responsibility of a decision would pass on to the laws. Because, for example, for handball, everyone in England, I know, has gone up in, in the hair going, oh, you know, handball, handball, now everything is handball, it's the new laws. And it's like, and everyone is saying, well, actually... It's not really the new rewording of the laws. It's just that it wasn't applied the same way that it was now. But now it's more, um, it's more consistent with what they do in Europe. But people are not used to it, so everyone is complaining. But truth is, if people knew that that's what the law say, well, that's not the referee's fault for enforcing a law. It's the law that maybe needs to be reviewed, which is one of the areas that you mentioned before. Absolutely, yeah. A review of law is, is definitely something that could help officials. And I think they need to think more about like how it actually applies and how it might sit with people when uh, officials take certain kind of action. Um, yeah, it's, it, I mean, the handball ones is such a great example of that. Like people were screaming for kind of more objectivity there and saying, you know, it, it comes up a lot. Gary Lineker's tweets, <laughs> and I absolutely love Gary by the way, he's the reason I got interested in football in the first place. So I don't want to be too harsh on him. Um, but he did tweet like a few years ago saying, let's just make it. So if it hits your hand, it's handball and that's it. And now it's like every other weekend he's saying, oh, that's handball. Like we might as well pack up and go home. Like it's, and, it, and it's, yeah, that's how hard it is, Gary. Like that's how hard <laughs> it is to interpret in, in a split second with all these other factors that I talk about in part one of the book, by the way, yeah. that are going to influence your decision. Like it's, it's nigh on impossible. Plus the fact that the laws actually, you said there, like, oh, this is why this happened. Well, actually, a lot of the laws are kind of like, well, it's about interpretation. Like the handball one says something along the lines of, and I'm not quoting verbatim here, but it states something along the lines of a referee can kind of use discretion in certain situations. So automatically, like that kind of law is saying, well, you know, we want to apply it in most situations, but there are kind of, we appreciate there's going to be times where a referee's got to make their mind up. Essentially, that's what they're there for. And we need to think, mm. just let these people do their jobs. Yeah. Oh, Gary, I'm glad you mentioned Gary Lineker. I, I love him, you know, <laughs> growing up watching him on Match of the Day. But he's, oh my God, he has got this thing in his head about VAR. It is constant. Uh -huh. All he does is complain about VAR. Oh, change the record, Gary. 
Yeah, man. It's, 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 if you don't like it, it's fine. But, you know, match of the day, if what really makes me laugh is like, oh, do we really need these lines? And it's like, well, hang on. Like, I recall watching match of the day five, six years ago where you would bring up lines to show that the referee made a mistake. Yeah. yeah. Now the referee's using them to not make a mistake. It's wrong. Still but it was okay. To, yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, this player was two, two inches offside, they, so he shouldn't have... They blame VAR for everything, but they don't understand. So, like, if the ref goes to the monitor and still makes the wrong decision, they blame VAR. Oh. It's not VAR's fault. Yeah. VAR isn't a thing. It's just the referee made a, a mistake. <laughs> or interpreted differently to yeah. you. I think yeah. that's like... There's, there's a great example. I saw online line the other day. Of, it was in the, a German league, I think, where a player, like a, a defender and a goalkeeper got mixed up, right? And the defender passed it back to the goalkeeper and the goalkeeper kind of missed it. Mm. And so uh, an attacker latched onto the ball and he's by himself in the box and he dribbles up to the goal line and he's kind yeah. of like dilly dally and smashed it in. And then one of the defenders took offence to his kind of showboating, if you like, and the referee cautions the attacker for ungentlemanly conduct. Mm. And everyone was like, oh, but he hasn't done anything wrong and things like this. And Alessandro, you mentioned there, like, would it help if someone went out and explained the situation? It was, it's obvious, like, in that situation, the referee has interpreted that behaviour as ungentlemanly conduct. You can disagree with it. Like, that's fine. But you already know the explanation. And something that frustrates me now being a ref is someone will say, you know, why was that a foul? Or why did you give that? And you explain it. And then they want to disagree. And it's like, you don't have to agree. <laughs> Like, that's fine. Like, you have the right to disagree, but I have the right to interpret that action however I felt, you know, was, was, was correct. And, and in that instance, you know, I, I wouldn't have cautioned that player for doing that, but the referee felt so just accept it. Yeah. And there's so many factors to it because in that particular episode, what the footage never really showed is that there was a bit of a one on one with the attacker and the defender. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but everyone focused on one part. So if, and say, for example, it was a mistake. Even if someone came on and said, well, there was a mistake because, or there was right because, at least you have an action. And Jack said it really well earlier when we were having a chat between amongst ourselves. He said, you go out and give it an explanation. Doesn't necessarily mean that the referee is not going to referee again, mm -hmm. but it's admitting that the, a mistake was made and accepting that mistakes are going to be made. And mm -hmm. just because you made a mistake, it doesn't mean that you're going to be dropped because a, a striker that misses a penalty He's still going to start next week. Uh, yeah. It's not going to change that. Yeah, that's called idiosyncrasy credit. So something that I talk about in the book is like Ronaldo can go and miss a penalty and Juventus fans or Portugal fans aren't going to boo him for missing a penalty because they yeah. know he's going to score goals for them and he's built up enough credit in the bank to make a mistake. Yeah. Officials have an exceptionally high uh, rate of, of success, particularly when compared to players. So in, in some tests done with officials compared to players, for example, players get about 50% of decisions right. Imagine how a player would feel if you as a referee got one in two decisions right. And then percentages vary on how many refs get right. It, it ranges from about 80% in some formal tests to Kalina stating in the last World Cup that referees were getting 92% without VAR and about 98 with VAR. Now, one, it's hard to say something is absolutely correct because, as I mentioned, there are so many laws that are kind of open to interpretation and subjectivity. But what it does show is that referees do tend to, you know, they should have credit in the bank. And yet, if a referee makes one mistake, a referee can go 89 minutes and have a perfect game and no one has any complaints. And then if they make one decision, maybe they give a free kick that most people don't feel was, but from their angle at that particular time, they felt it was. And then that team go and score. The referee was crap. They cost them the game. You know, for me, that, that just illustrates how difficult that role yeah. is and, and how they're, like Tom would say, they're a total outgroup. They're, they're just completely disassociated because they don't have any credit because no one attributed that credit to them in the first place. Yeah, out of the two, three hundred decisions you make in a game, you yeah. get the last one wrong and people forget that you had in the bank those two, three hundred right. Or the five games before them with that yeah. game. Yeah. Decision-making accuracy tends to go down if it's a tight game. In the, so, it, you guys, this study was uh, on Aussie Rules Football and they found right. that, yeah, yeah, it was really interesting. I quote it in the book. They, so these guys did a study on Austra Australian Rules Football and they looked at if it's a tight game, where one kick or one, like, you know, I know there's different ways of scoring in Australian football with different levels of points, but if yeah, one yeah. kind of score, if you like, can change the result of a game, decision-making accuracy dramatically increases in the last five minutes of the game because referees are more kind of thinking, I don't really want to make a decision 
that will influence the outcome of the game. So they kind of deliberately will kind of, well, I say deliberately, so maybe sort of subconsciously kind of veer away from that. They won't give it unless they're absolutely sure. Whereas at other periods of the game, they're kind of more confident in the decision-making ability. And again, that's, that's the social payoff. That's the, you know, I want people to approve of my performance. And I think that's another impact of the crowd. So everything kind of, it's all deeply entangled. It's all really intertwined. And hope in the book, I kind of separate it enough that we can make sense of it. Yeah. I mean, you can paraphrase it in football, in our football, thinking if a team is winning 5-0, you know, 5-0, and the team losing 5-0 has a 50-50 a penalty in the area, which is mm -hmm. very doubtful, you're more likely to give it because 5-0, 5-1, Is it really going to change much in a league game? No. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there are studies presented in the book that would support that view. And also I give kind of what I want to do in the book is make it accessible to people that, you know, who want to read like a bunch of academic studies. You want to see it in real life. So one of the examples I give, if you remember, there was the game between Real Madrid and Juventus a couple of years ago in the Champions League. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Juventus were, I, I want to say, 3-0 down on aggregate. Uh, they lost 3-0 at home. And then at the Bernabeu, they brought it back to 3-3. And then in like the 94th minute, um, the referee, the Englishman, Michael Oliver, he gave uh, uh, Ronaldo, Real Madrid yeah. a penalty. Yeah. yeah. And Buffon got sent off for the protests. Yeah. And after the game, Buffon saying, oh, he has a rubbish bin for a heart. Yeah. And he said, in that situation, I think the exact quote is something along the lines of, in that situation at that time, I should be able to say whatever I want to him because it's such a heated moment. And for me, that just completely illustrates it. It's kind of like at the same, like although players want consistency and fans want consistency, they also kind of have this really keen sense of fairness and, oh, they come back from three. Well, the fact of the matter is, the guy fouled the guy in the box in the 94th minute. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking because it was such a great comeback from Juventus. But the laws are the laws. And if you want consistency, Oliver did the right thing. And, and comments such as he has a rubbish bin for a heart don't particularly help. It's, mm -hmm. you know, Again, what do we want? Do we want consistency or do we want common sense and entertainment? Yeah, absolutely. I know, Jack, you took it really personally. Uh, that was horrible. <laughs> I used to think Buffon was brilliant. And after that, I think he's an arsehole. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, but people are human beings. So Buffon like, apologized afterwards once it calmed down. And I think the dangerous thing for referees to do is to mm. rationalize behavior too much. So I think a lot of referees, and this is what I think Oliver did really well there, mm. was he looked at that completely objectively So I think that what a lot of referees report is they'll say, oh, it's just the heat of the moment. Like, let him say what he wants. And actually, I don't think that helps anyone. It doesn't help referees at the top level. It doesn't help referees at the bottom level. So I think Oliver acted correctly in that situation. Yeah. And it's too easy to rationalize people's behaviors. Referees have to regulate their emotions. I'm sure there's been times where you guys have been out on the field and you've wanted to say something <laughs> and you've had to bite your tongue. Yeah, uh, I certainly have. And yet you so you know, and that helps your performance. We actually know that if you regulate your emotions, it actually helps improve your performance often. Players and fans will call it passion, but it's actually it's you know, it's, it's just abuse, it's just losing control. And and you know, maintaining control would actually help you, help you improve. But you know, we can't we can't judge a, a referee on one mistake or one error, so maybe we shouldn't judge Buffon for that one pressure. Very true, <laughs> very true, point taken. But um, <laughs> that's that's of course the challenge of Of referees, and in that case, that particular incident to use as a bigger picture, um, referees do um, understand the emotions of players, and it is that balance between trying to make a, an objective decision and also trying to understand the emotions. But then there are also points in time where you say players can overstep that mark, where you want to try and give them the benefit of the doubt, you want to try and understand their emotions that. You know, you already hit them with the penalty. You've already hit them with probably the goal that's going to send them out. Um, so there might have even been a higher threshold that the referee is prepared to take. But unfortunately, sometimes the players are still overstepping that mark. And that's the real art to referees. There is definitely a place for referees to empathize with the players, to understand why they responded and to not further fuel that fire and to, to pick their battles. But then there's also that balance of sometimes, even though you might feel you, you can completely understand why they have done it in the heat of the moment but you need to know that no that is too far sorry and the action still has to be taken yeah actually it's interesting because last weekend in inter versus napoli the napoli captain got sent off for telling the referee ma vai a cagare which means get the fuck out or something like that um after the referee gave the most obvious penalty not just because it was for inter which is my team but it was clear as day 
And uh, the problem was, and there was a lot of discussions because obviously everyone was complaining and they're like, you know, it's the 80th minute, captain, the game was 0-0, that Napoli deserved to be up, to be fair. And obviously you get a penalty against which is going to cost you the game, most likely. And obviously in the heat of the moment, you just say something, which then he apologized for. And, you know, the, talking through it with referees, what, you, what we sort of thought is, well, it wasn't that obvious that he was saying those things, but because there was no crowd, you could actually hear exactly yeah. what he said. So there, the referee, you can see he looks at him, sort of thinks about it, and that's so loud, and everyone around, all the interplayers start going, hey, he said that he said yeah. that. What's he going to do? Is he going to say, no, you mm -hmm. can do it? Straight away, red card, thanks for coming. Maybe with a crowd, he could have gone, I didn't hear it, yeah. and understand that that was just a hit yeah. at the moment. Obviously, because it wasn't, there wasn't je offensive gestures. It wasn't like him going aggressively towards him, but it was just like, he was walking away, turned around and goes, oh, ma vai a cagare. And then it's something that the referee maybe could have managed going, he was going away, I didn't hear it. And then have a good, small, you know, the classic quiet word and going, oi, I heard you, I said mm -hmm. your ass there, just behave yourself because otherwise you're out the first stupid thing you do. This, this is the referee's call. This is the role of interpretation, the role of an arbiter. And, yeah. you know, I'm not, Again, I'd rather look at systems rather than individuals. So if the, if the system suggests that a referee can use his or her discretion as they see fit, that's the system. And we need to think about the pros of that and maybe the drawbacks. So the drawback may, may be consistency, but the strength would be you know, game management, So which is more important. I think these, these are the questions that need to be asked rather than this referee made a mistake. So Stuart, it's been awesome chatting to you this evening, this morning for you. I've definitely learned a lot and I think the... the You've talked about the systems and the psychology behind it has been really, really interesting. Uh, Have you changed your mind about Buffon? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> aside from tuning into UEFA's new show, Man in the Middle, where they obviously you feature, um, where can people uh, hear from you? Where can they get your book? Uh, what's the best way to, to get into yeah, it? Yeah, th well, thanks a lot for having me on, first of all. I've really enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure talking to you guys. Uh, yeah, so the book is called Blowing the Whistle, The Psychology of Football Refereeing. It's available on all online retailers. Uh, you can also get it direct from the publisher, which is Benny and Kearney. And you can get in touch with me via Twitter. My handle there is Stu, S-C-U, Carrington, 07. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, hopefully there's a, you know, I'm sure there's been a bit of interest generated from the man in the middle and you've become a... a a bit of a face in the refereeing world all of a sudden, which is, which is quite cool. It's quite cool. But no, boys, I, I've really enjoyed the, the chat with Stuart. I, I'm sure you two have as, as well. So lots of great anecdotes, lots of great references to put it all in perspective. It was really good. Yeah. The yeah. other thing I loved, especially about the book, is that there's so much actual psychology and proper facts to help you understand the research. It was really, really, really interesting. Well, so there you go. Uh, Rev coach community, go out. You heard it from Ale. It's the book <laughs> to have. Christmas is well, just gone when this goes to air. But if you want a present for the new year, there you go. <laughs> but no, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. No, not at all. Thanks very much, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, hit the subscribe button. For more referee education, join our Facebook group and become a Ref Coach member for free at refcoach.org. If you like the work we do, you can support us by purchasing a Ref Coach whistle to show that you are part of the Ref Coach community when you're out on the pitch.